So there's a spectrum of quality with spring water, but I do think that there are many that are still incredible all over the planet. And in some places, they've really been stewarded. They've really been tended to and protected. And that's really what I'd, I want to inspire. If my work inspires anything, it's let's really tend to these sacred sites. Let's preserve them for future generations and let's honor them for the birth of life that they are. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Medicine Stories podcast, where we are remembering what it is to be human upon the earth. I am your host, Amber Magnolia Hill. This is episode 72 with Isabel Friend. Getting back into that water. It's so important. It's so miraculous and beautiful and truly life's sacred matrix. I could spend the rest of the life of this podcast talking about water. I'm not going to, but I could. And really stoked to get even deeper into the subject today with Isabel. You all loved the last episode with Dr. Carly Newday. And so we're just going to keep exploring the fractal edges of H2O and beyond because it's not just H2O. I want to tell you before we get into it, I know people usually save this for the end, but I think you are going to want to know about Isabel's online offerings because as you listen, you're going to want to know more about probably many of the things that we talk about, just not enough time to get into all of it. And there is a discount code available for her online course, Navigating the Waters at Patreon as well. I'll tell you about that in a minute. And it's for everyone. You don't have to be a patron. Um, But first, let me let you know about her free webinar, which is called A Living Liquid Crystal. It is about the life-changing magic, mystery, and science of water will help you transform your relationship to an understanding of the liquid source of life. This is all at Isabel's website, which is waterislife.love. There, she also has a PDF resource guide, which is a curated list of recommended water filters, vortexers, structures, minerals, supplements, and more top water tools and tech. And then finally, the seven-day e-course, Navigating the Waters, what to drink, what not to drink, and why. Find out how different kinds of water affects your mind and your body very differently, because what you drink, you become. I took this course and watched the webinar, and the webinar was mind-blowing. I have never pushed pause to take notes so often, taken in any content ever before. And then the e-course is why to not drink the kind of water that you're probably drinking, bottled water, tap water, reverse osmosis, the Kangen machines, I forget what they're called, like the ionized pH something, and then what kind of water to drink, and then, yeah, how to restructure your water, which if you listen to the last episode and after you listen to this one, you're going to want to know how to do for sure. And there's a ton of resources and links directly to places for more information or to check out the products that Isabel recommends. She also has coming up, it's not out as of this moment, but it will be out in November 2020, a new online course called Internal Oceans, Exploring the Hydrospheres of the Human Body of Water. In this course, you'll be introduced to a new paradigm of understanding health that centers the primacy of the fluid systems of the body. After all, our aquatic bodies are 70% water volumetrically and 99.92% water molecularly. We are bodies of water, and water is life. So leveraging the health and vitality of our internal waters is the key to a long, thriving life. And this simple shift in perception holds the missing keys in health, wellness, vitality, and embodiment. As Carly and I talked about at the end of the last episode, if you are paying attention to the food you're eating, but not to the water you're drinking... There's a disconnect there, and I've, that's, I've been in that disconnected space for a long time now, but it's so important to be drinking good water. It's more important than the food you're eating. So 20% off coupon code for Isabel's eCourse at patreon.com slash medicine stories. And I almost always, I think always do coupon codes just for patrons. But for this one, I'm not doing that because I really, really want you all to have this information. 
I just, the world would be completely changed if everyone was drinking good, pure, structured water. And I want the world to be completely changed. So I want to make this as accessible as possible. I will add as well that the course is already only $33. So it's already super affordable and 20% off coupon code. And Isabel says that if anyone can't make that big of a stretch because of COVID or life or whatever to pay for that, just message her through the website and she will hook you up. And finally, I want to let you know If you are listening to this within the first few days of its release, that this Friday, October 16th, we are having our big fall release of our extra potent elderberry elixir over at mythicmedicine.love. We are a dot love as well as Isabel. It is made with exquisite care and abundant experience using the most potent extraction methods for each herb formulated for maximum immune supportive effectiveness and utilizing the best of both modern science and folk herbalism. We worked really hard on this recipe. It takes us three or four days to make each batch. It's a multi, multi, multi step process. Every herb is extracted differently, even though there's two herbs that are tinctures, two herbs that are decoctions and two herbs that are juices. They are all extracted in different ways. They're juiced in different ways, decocted in different ways, and tinctured in different ways to get the most immune supportive and virus fighting constituents of that herb into your body. Kids love it. It's delicious and it usually sells out. So jump on it if you're interested. And I make no guarantees, no promises. If you're listening to this at any point in the future, this medicine is seasonal and there's long stretches of time when we don't have it listed at all. So get on it if you want some and it's available. Okay. Thrilled, truly thrilled to share this conversation with you and keep spreading the good news about water. Oh, and last night Owen and I watched Kiss the Ground on Netflix. It would behoove you to watch that film after you listen to this episode. There are some really potent connections made between soil health, water, carbon, climate change. It's all connected. It's all connected. And I was so glad to have some pieces filled in. Like Isabel talks about desertification in this episode. I didn't really know what that meant or realize I didn't know what that meant until I watched Kiss the Ground. And now I am so happy to have a better understanding of what is happening with water wars, what is happening with climate change, and how simple, easy it is to turn this all around by tending the soil, y'all. So expect an upcoming episode on that. And without further ado, here's my interview with Isabel Friend. All right. Hi, Isabel. Welcome to Medicine Stories. I'm so happy to have you here today. Your work is brilliant brilliantly presented, so important for the world and all of its inhabitants. So thank you and welcome. Mm, Thank you so much, Amber. I'm really, really honored to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yes. My most recent guest was Dr. Carly Newday, who I know you admire just as much as I do. And I do. I love her work. Brilliant. So brilliant. And her book, Water Codes, But as she said at the end of our interview, she's not great at marketing herself. She doesn't have the whole like social media apparatus and getting the information out there beyond the brilliant book. And so I appreciate so much that all this information that maybe that episode helped to whet people's appetite, like now they can drop in with you and you have your YouTube channel, your Instagram, your online courses so much out there. So let's begin by explaining to people, and we did talk about this in the last episode, but for anyone who hasn't heard that one yet, the difference between bulk and structured water and what scientists and researchers mean when they say that water is a liquid crystal. Mm -hmm. That's a great place to start. So I know you guys covered it in the last episode, so I'll just touch briefly on it. But basically, Most of the water that we've come into contact with and that we've drunk in our lives is what's called bulk water. And bulk water is where the H2O molecules are bouncing off each other and they're forming connections and breaking apart billions of times per second. And so it's really sort of chaotic inside this water. 
and crystalline water looks the same, but it actually behaves very differently. The molecules snuggle up together so that they can talk, they can communicate, they can exchange information, and they do so by means of their electrostatic hydrogen bonds. So you get all of these hydrogen bonded molecules coming together and they form hexagonal clusters, and these clusters form these geometric sheets. Now every single cluster of water molecules has 440,000 panels on it. And each one of those panels is responsible for sensing, storing, and transmitting information about its environment. So I think it was Dr. Rustam Roy who said that structured water is the world's most malleable computer. And I don't love the fact that that sort of makes water seem like this inanimate object. I think it's the perception of water as an inanimate object that has caused so much water in the world to become bulk and unstructured and lifeless. But I think it's a really apt analogy nevertheless, because just like silicon dioxide or the quartz uh, that are in computer chips can store and transmit information, so can crystalline phase water. It's actually a completely separate phase beyond solid, liquid, and gas. It's what Dr. Gerald Pollack calls the fourth phase of water. And what's amazing about it is that unlike a silicon dioxide quartz chip where you have two states, so you have what's commonly referred to as the ones and the zeros of computer information, computer memory, right? You have something is either a one or a zero. It's either on or off. And from those two states, all of the information, all of the cat pictures, everything on the entire internet can be stored in that. But water actually has six different phase states. It's specifically the oxygen that has these six different uh, valence or oxidative potentials. And so if you do the math on that, two states versus six states, it's something staggering, like something like a billion times more information can be stored in water than in a computer chip. Now think about the most advanced nano computers that we have on this planet, and water is so far beyond that, that it's really in this state, in this crystalline state, it really is sort of the body of information itself, the body of intelligence itself. There's this property of, of the bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen being likened to liquid light. I think it was Dr. May Wan Ho who said that Structured water is actually a lot like liquid light because it contains so much information and it really does store all of the memory and all of the history of our planet and even beyond because water actually comes from the cosmos. It didn't originate here on earth and it remembers its travels and its entire history. And we have access to that within our bodies. The most beautiful thing to realize is that when we say we're made of water, you know, we're 70% water by volume or 99.92%, there's no like exact way to quantify it, but they say around 99.92% water molecularly, it's not bulk water. It's not what you have in your glass right now. It is this, this living structured crystalline water. And so your body is very much liquid light. It's very much this crystalline phase, which is what gives it its vitality. So what gives you your energy, your awareness, your consciousness, your ability to be a living, vibrant, vital being in this world. And that's true of every living being. Bio water is another sort of way of describing structured water because every the water inside of every living thing is highly structured. And another really important distinction, I think, between crystalline water and bulk water is to recognize that the healthier you are and the younger you are, the more structured your body water is. In other words, the stronger those electrostatic hydrogen bonds will be. But as we age or as we are exposed to inflammation and all of these, you know, toxic modern lifestyle factors and electromagnetic frequencies and all of this, our body waters tend to lose the strength of those hydrogen bonds. They tend to loosen bit by bit and just become a little bit more closer towards that bulk phase. And that's when we see the signs of aging. That's when we see symptoms of disease. So the distinction between bulk and crystalline water, even though it's not apparently obvious when you look 
at a glass of water. It might look the same either way, but it's really just worlds apart. And it's so empowering when you when you recognize the implications that that has on your physical body of water. Mm, absolutely. I this is a quote from you. If your body is made of structured water, you will affect the people around you. You will affect whatever water comes through your body and back into the watershed. You will affect whatever bodies of water you swim in and you will be a physically healing presence. It's, mm. it's just, it's unendingly mind blowing. The deeper I dive into water to learn about the seemingly infinite potential that structured water has to completely rewrite society and and ecology and life on earth as we know it absolutely i mean the more i look into i've been studying water for 11 years now and i have not found a single question that water doesn't have some sort of answer for and especially when it comes to these these hardest questions of you know ecology and politics and sociology and and the climate and and so much water has these incredibly simple and graceful solutions for them. And I, I just want to speak to the quote that you mentioned, because that's, you know, I, I sort of toe the line between being kind of woo and, and being very, very scientific. But everything I say has some, some scientific basis to it. And I don't think you can really separate spirit from science. I think that um, they're just two languages for the same, the same way of describing natural phenomenon. And I do think that water is really where spirit and science meet in some incredibly profound ways. So when I say that you affect bodies of water around you, the more structured your body waters are, it's because of a property known as epitaxy or transference. So that is where something that is in a highly structured, highly ordered crystalline state I mean, anything that's in a crystalline state, we're just referring to something whose arrangement is in an organized repeating pattern, something whose arrangement is in a matrix. And so it's very, very ordered and it will bring more order to anything in its environment that is somewhat chaotic. So for example, that's why you see some people putting crystals in their water because the, wa the crystal is so highly structured that the bulk water around it may to some degree form a bit of a bit more coherence and i think it's the same with your body your body because it has that crystalline structure also operates with this principle of epitaxy this principle of transference when you are highly highly coherent when your your body water molecules are highly coherent then they can actually channel more coherent vibrations of thought patterns and energy patterns through your body and and you actually, through epitaxy, bring more order, bring more structure to everything in your environment. You become a physically healing presence. Mm. So as I told you before we started recording, I've never had so many notes <laughs> out before I interviewed someone. I have full five pages of notes. So just forgive me listeners if I'm all over the place because there's, there's, it's, it's so epic and important. And there's so much to talk about. It is truly like a lifetime study. If you really want to be a person who understands water, it is a lifetime of study. Why don't we just jump right to Victor Schauberger? And I would love for you to tell us who he was, what he discovered about water and how he's inspired you. I would love to. Schauberger is actually my favorite. I have this giant post-mortem crush on him, to be honest. Mm -hmm. He's completely brilliant. So he's known as the water wizard throughout history. Um, he was alive back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And he had a deeper understanding of water than any hydrologist alive even today. And he actually was able to understand water according to him by certain practices of he would lie down by a river and he said he would just let his consciousness go and he would let it flow down the river and when it returned back to him it was full of information <laughs> and this is how he received ideas for just brilliant inventions so he 
invented, for example, free energy devices that operate on the principles of water. So for example, I mean, how does, how does nature never slow down? Nature never suffers from entropy. Nature is always creating and sustaining and recycling life. And it's through the power of water that she's able to do so. So he was able to tap into levitational properties of water. So we've really, we've really grasped gravity in this culture, but for every force, there's an equal and opposite force, right? So how is water able to rise from the roots to the crown of a tree through these properties of levity? How is water able to rise from the depth of an aquifer to the very height of a spring at the top of a mountain through these properties of levity? that have a lot to do with, with the hydrogen bond. So he actually created levitational devices as a result of that. And if even one of his insights were to be adopted, it would radically transform the world because what he discovered is that there's this primary duality of principles that nature operates on, implosion and explosion. And they're both necessary. They're both, it's completely necessary for both of them to be in balance for nature to, to thrive in the way that she does. Implosion is a cooling energy generating force that nature uses when she's, when she's creating, when something is, is thriving, right? Like for example, in your heart. So your heart is actually not a muscle that pumps blood, it's actually, if you were to unroll the heart, it's a one really long muscle. It's actually spiraled in upon itself. And with every beat, it's actually generating a vortex that implodes your blood that gives it enough momentum to then spiral through your veins. So water doesn't just flow through your veins. You have spiral striations on the inside. And as it spirals through your veins, it structures the blood and it has this sort of implosive principle, right? And everywhere in nature where, where we see these implosive spirals, we see energy generation. And that's a very water-based principle versus what we see all of human technology is based on a very fire-based principle of explosion. Nature uses explosion when she wants to break down and decay and decompose. So it's an important part of the cycle of life, but it's very much the death part of the life cycle. Anything that is explosive is going to use more energy than it generates, and it's going to foster death and decay. Now, what are all human technologies based on? They're all explosive, all of them. And our, all of our societies are run on these explosive fire-based principles. So if we were to make this fundamental shift just this one change from explosive to implosive, not only could we operate with free energy, no more dirty coal, no more nuclear power, none of that crap, but we would actually be operating where our technology is in harmony with nature instead of antagonistic to it. So Schauberger was way ahead of his time and he saw the ways that we were treating water even back in the late 1800s and he laid it out he spelled it out full stop he said if we continue treating water as an inanimate object and we continue you know forcing her in straight lines and through right angles in pipes and rerouting rivers and things like that then unequivocally the results of that will be massive climate disasters it will be massive ecological instability. And he went a step further and he said, if we continue drinking dead water, it's going to create a lot of psychological instability. It's going to create people with very immature habits and patterns. It's going to create people who are not able to store enough, as much information in their bodies. And basically he said, it's going to be, create dumb people who are very violent and warring. And we see that again, all over the world today. So the nice thing though, is he also spelled out ways that we can sort of reroute ourselves and, and ameliorate the situation. And it all comes back to turning towards water and turning towards 
life, turning towards nature and learning from nature. His motto was actually comprehend and copy nature. And I don't know of anyone else who, in history, who has done so more thoroughly than Schauberger. It's a shame more people don't know his name. Yeah, I first heard about him from Dr. Zach Bush, who is one of the humans I admire most in the world. And I listen to him on every podcast interview and, you know, follow him so closely. And Dr. Zach Bush was really emulating that work and modeling nature. Yeah, he's brilliant. I love Dr. Zach Bush for sure. I love his work on phase angles in particular. He's, he's done a lot of good research into hydration markers. Yes, I've heard him talk about that with Dr. Joseph Marcola. <laughs> okay, my mind is vortexing, spiraling, water <laughs> back into a thousand things you said that we could talk about, but I going back to uh, Schauberger Lane by the side of the river. And this was in Austria, is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was a naturalist in Austria. He he claimed that drinking the highest quality water allowed him to access ancestral memories. And like, of course, you know, that makes so much sense if we're drinking crystalline, highly structured water as our ancestors did, that we are going to like remember what it is to be human on the earth and be able to access these like greater intelligences. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, they hadn't discovered DNA yet during his time, but I think that what he was tapping into is very possibly, I mean, he knew for a fact that he was able to access his ancestral memories through his communion with water. And we know that our DNA is actually held in its chiral shape by highly structured water molecules. Like the the molecules inside of your double helix are what give it that spiraling formation. They're these highly, highly structured icosahedral calathrate molecules. And it's possible that he was he was tuning into that antenna. Because you know, as a as a crystal, water is able to receive and transduce and transmit frequencies, and that receivership is, it really acts a lot like an antenna in that way. An antenna tuned to the ethers, tuned to the the quantum field. Mm-hmm. And thinking about, I mean, we're literally talking about levitation, free energy even time or space travel as you go into brilliantly in your webinar. So like, again, the um, implications are just so enormous. And as you say in that webinar too, if the true nature of water were known, our economy would destabilize because inherent in water is a powerful supercomputer capable of free energy generation, infinite information storage, and even levitation. So I mean, this is, you know, there's a reason we don't know this. It, it is in the interests of the powers that be and capitalism that, that we not fully understand the inherent potential of structured water. Absolutely. Well, I think it's also just a little bit sort of our modern bias too, that it all kinds of sounds like science fiction when you, when you state it in that way. Um, but when you look at what's coming out of these laboratories, like it, it literally, it seems like science fiction, like the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, um, they were doing some studies on the quantum state of water, and they found that the same water molecule can occupy six different locations in space. So it can bilocate, it can sextolocate. The same water molecule can actually be in multiple locations at once the same water molecule can pass through solid walls what they're finding at the at this laboratory the quantum state of water is truly incredible and it provides a lot of insight i think into some of the cds and the capabilities that were spoken of in in really advanced enlightened masters, you know, being able to walk on water, for example, or some of the saints and sages in India that were able to bilocate and mm-hmm. and trilocate and be in multiple places at the same time. You know, I think it makes sense when you think of life itself, right? Life itself is the ultimate mystery. And so water as the body of life, as the body of consciousness, is an incredible mystery. And of course, it's 
it's not going to operate on the same principles as everything else. It's, you know, there are over 63 anomalies about water that ways that it just defies the laws of physics. And it would have to defy the laws of physics if it sustains all life and all consciousness in the cosmos. Right. I mean, that that alone, 63 properties, at least of water, that are anomalies that science cannot explain. Because here is water, the very medium and matrix of all life, all consciousness. As you said, it, of course, would need to deny the laws of physics in order to sustain life, or at least it does deny the laws of physics in order to sustain life. And I love that you bring in this word mystery. I you know, like so many people have just been going through a really hard time lately and came to this moment of like, what sustains me? What at the deepest level, like gives me hope and nourishes my soul. And for me, the word that came was mystery. I actually love that I'm mm. in the mystery. I love that the universe is mysterious and that I don't know all the answers and that I never will. Like what a gift to be able to humble ourselves before the mystery and water just being this ultimate life-giving mother mystery. Absolutely. It's like a constant invitation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's like this constant teasing, this constant beckoning where all of existence is calling you forward, not just to discover, but also to create. And what I love about water is, you know, I started studying water externally. I was a nutritionist. I was living in New York. I thought, what's the best quality water we can be drinking? And so it started as sort of this external thing. But then the more that I learn about water, it's really just called me deeper inward, 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 because this is what we are. 99.92% of us is this water. And so it's really this inward mystery, this inward journey that just keeps revealing layers upon layers. And like you said, in the beginning, you can study water your entire life and still barely scratch the surface. Mm. I mean, I could talk about this stuff forever, <laughs> the mystery <laughs> and the consciousness and the potential. And as I said in, in my intro to the most recent episode with Dr. Carly Newday, like where is the modern, like the Nikola Tesla or the Elon Musk of structured water? You know, what would Schauberger be working on if he were here today? Like what, what could we do if we were able to harness this? Mm -hmm. You know, I think one guy who was starting to come close uh, in his work was Dr. Marcel Vogel. He did some really incredible work with water. I'm actually really honored and, and grateful to be on a team of incredible water scientists right now who are doing some amazing work. But the, the thing is, it's very rare for their discoveries to leave the pages of these dry, you know, peer-reviewed studies in these scientific journals, they don't really make it into the mainstream very often. You know, even those studies from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, like you would think it would be breaking news, like water can pass through solid walls. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I think because water just has this, you know, everyone commonly just perceives water as the most common, ubiquitous, simple, boring thing, that there, there's no way that people would, I think most people would even believe that if they heard it. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, you know, where Carly and I and, and Beta Austin and just some of these other amazing water researchers come in because we're sort of trying to take this work from the research journals and put it into common parlance that everyone can understand and hopefully relate with on some level. Yeah. And, you know, going back to what you said about science and spirituality, Carly and I talked about this as well. It does seem on the surface so unbelievable that, you know, you can understand why people immediately turn off to it. Or I learned the phrase hydro hippies from you. And I live in a very <laughs> new age community in Northern California. And there are, you know, just like certain people who I just like roll my eyes at with some of their new age beliefs. And I, and I, I think I did think this about water for a while, like, Oh, cool sticker on your water bottle, chick, you know, that's really doing something for you. And so, so I understand why it's just so mind blowing that people like they have to, it, it takes some depth of thought and feeling to really comprehend what water is and can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I, kudos to everybody who is trying and has faith in the power of, you know, slapping the word love on your water bottle. Um, I'm sure it's doing something, but it's, 
the thing is we can quantify all of this in our laboratory. We can look at the effect uh, in the structure of water. And so we can see that doing that alone to bulk water has very, very little effect. I love Dr. Masaru Emoto. I absolutely love his work, but it was challenging for other researchers to, to replicate some of his findings because for many reasons, but one of the reasons was that, you know, he would take maybe 500 photos of a sample of water and then only select and only publish the photo of the crystal that was most highly formed. And so it gave this impression that all of the water clusters in the entire glass of water were that perfectly formed. Now, of course, there are ways to hack this imprinting process so that whatever you want to imprint your water with does have a lot more effect. So for example, Theodore Schwenk, one of my favorite researchers, he showed that water is at its most sensitive when it's moving. He used to refer to water as the earth's sensory organ, which I just love, or the sensitive chaos. And he showed that when water is moving, that's when it's most sensitive to pick things up. So if you expose your water to the word love or a powerful symbol while it's vortexing, it's going to have a lot more effect. But even more so than that, there was a researcher named, I think it was Dr. Korakov. I might be butchering the name. He's a Russian scientist. Korakov, Korakov yeah. And he showed that water, more than anything else, more than electromagnetic frequency, more than light, more than sound, more than visual stimuli, more than auditory stimuli, all of that, it's most sensitive to human emotion. So if you really want to imprint your water with love, for example, or gratitude, for example, the most powerful way to do that is to really feel that emotion while you're drinking it, because as it flows down your throat, it's moving and it's imprinting on this emotion that you're holding. You know, it's just, it's making me realize, I think we all know in our depths that we are incredibly powerful beings, that consciousness is so powerful and at play with all the other consciousnesses in the universe all the time. And here is this super simple way to, to yeah, imprint our thoughts and emotions onto a substance that is then going to be imbibed by us, taken into our bodies and like what a beautiful feedback loop. Mm -hmm. And not just imprint, but also amplify too. Mm -hmm. I mean, cause you could feel that emotion on your own and it would be beautiful. I mean, that's really all you need, but water amplifies frequencies. Like when sound travels through water, it travels so much faster than it travels through air. Or I don't know if you've ever done this experiment where and if you have one of those car keys that unlocks your car from a distance, and if you're walking through a parking lot and you can't find your car, you can actually hold that car key up to a jug of water and the water will amplify the frequency so that even if your car is beyond the range of the little button, you'll still be able to hear your car alarm go off. So it's another one of these crystalline properties of water, you know, that it, that it amplifies. And so it does that with our prayers and it does that with our intentions as well. It really holds them and amplifies them. One of the most fascinating rabbit holes of research that really has just captivated my heart. You can devote an entire lifetime just to studying the indigenous wisdom teachings about water and the history of water practices throughout the world. I mean, water has been used in pretty much every kind of religious ceremony in every religion from birth to death. It is a fundamental part of religious life and it's a fundamental part of spiritual life cross-culturally. And the indigenous wisdom keepers have some incredible stories and understandings of water. But what you see as the most common theme throughout all of them is that water is always sort of seen as this mediator between the etheric and the worldly realms. You know, both ancient myths and modern premises sort of agree on this, that water is the mediator. And for the Kogi people of Colombia, for example, they understood that water itself is the origin of reality. For them, the structure of the, the entire world is sustained by water. It's sort of this holographic 
All of the world itself is, all of the universe is contained in each drop of water. Every river, every runoff, every raindrop maintains the world. And so as we relate to water, we are creating the universe in a sense. The way we treat water is what will be reflected back to us, literally reflected in the world that we see around us. You know, they, they understand water as the metaphysical blueprint of existence. It holds the map of reality. All worlds are reality, right? From dreams to the structures of daily life to psychic visions in medicine journeys, all of these are maintained by water. And so when you pour that emotion into your water, it's not only a prayer for yourself, but automatically it's a prayer for the rest of the universe because all waters are connected. Hmm. <sighs> yeah, I love that you, you talk mm -hmm. about in your, in your beautiful webinar, being a rogue water blesser. <laughs> Just blessing, blessing your quart of water and then going out and adding it to your local river or stream or irrigation ditch and, and putting that out into, mm -hmm. because it's all connected. Of course, it's all connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, be, and because of that, again, that property of epitaxy, that property of transference, if you make one glass of water or one quart of water, like you said, highly crystalline, it will have some effect on even an entire reservoir of bulk water. It might be a small effect, but can't underestimate the power of that. Mm -hmm. So let's continue turning our lens to the body and mm -hmm. our health. I love that your origin story here is as a nutritionist. And I, you know, I'm, I'm sure you had that moment where you realize, oh yes, it, it's important when we're eating, but oh my goodness, <laughs> we must know what we're drinking as well. And I think people are so confused about what kind of water to drink. And of course, many people are cut off from access to anything as far as they know, other than tap water or bottled water. So your, your online course is just brilliant. I'm so grateful for it. It's called Navigating the Waters. And you talk about, so it's seven days and they're all very short videos. Like looks like 17 minutes is the longest one. Tap water, bottled water, reverse osmosis and distilled water alkaline ionized water. So these are the first four days when you're talking about the kinds of water basically that most people are drinking. And, you know, my friend was telling me that her mom just spent $5,000 on a king and machine and kind of got, you know, roped in the MLM world. And then like the next day I saw the video that you put out about that. And, and Carly did speak to that very briefly at the last, at the end of our episode. So I don't want to spend too much of our time on all the water you shouldn't be drinking. <laughs> it's all here in your amazing, very affordable online course that you have a coupon code for as well. But let's talk about spring water, different kinds of, as you call them, water alchemy tools, like what people can do to structure their water at home. And then just some of the lifestyle factors involved in hydration. And again, you go much deeper into all of this in um, navigating the waters. So let's start with spring water. You know, Carly actually said that she doesn't believe that there's really any good spring water um, except for one in Maine. And then we didn't get to talk about the second one that she thinks is good, but I'm drinking spring water and I think it will probably continue to be the water that I seek out. You know, obviously it's awesome to be structuring and magnetizing and doing things to water at home, which we will talk about, but spring water is so important as well. And I would love to hear you know, your thoughts on it? Is that the kind of water you're drinking and how can people seek out a local spring? Mm -hmm. So in a way, I sort of agree with Carly that even our spring water is not what it once was. It's, it's not like the spring water of our ancestors. You know, the amount of deuterium, for example, which is an isotope of hydrogen, is so much higher in all water in the world now, except for glacial waters than it ever was, you know, a couple thousand years ago. But I think that spring water is the closest we can get to pristine and from the source. And I think that the communion that happens when we harvest directly from Mother Earth is maybe the most valuable part of that because it really is a pilgrimage that our ancestors have been making since, you know, even before we were Homo sapiens, since the dawn of time, all creatures have, have come to spring waters and, and certainly 
all cultures revere them as sacred places. Now, you do want to be conscientious. You know, when you visit a spring, is it in the middle of a cow field? You might not want to drink that water. You definitely, definitely want to get it tested. But if it is from a very, very, very deep aquifer, it's going to be a lot safer. If it's at the very, very top of a mountain, it's going to be much higher quality. So there's a spectrum of quality with spring water, but I do think that there are many that are still incredible all over the planet. And in some places, they've really been stewarded. They've really been tended to and protected. And that's really what I'd, I want to inspire. If my work inspires anything, it's let's really tend to these sacred sites. Let's preserve them for future generations and let's honor them for the birth of life that they are. Because, you know, our our blood is created from the water that we drink. It sounds obvious, right? But the water you drink actually becomes your blood within five minutes. And every other creature on earth receives their blood directly from the earth. But in this current paradigm, you know how we have all of these surrogate stand-ins between ourselves and the source. Are you paying a corporation for your bloodstream by buying bottled water? Are you paying the government for your bloodstream by buying municipal water? Or do you have that intimate communion with the earth where you are, she is able to live through you as you without the intermediaries of processing because all of the water that most people drink is, is highly, highly processed. And we don't want to eat highly processed food, right? We know by now that that's not good for us. And the same is true of water. So another really interesting phenomenon is that the springs are sort of where the inner waters of the earth, they come up and they meet the outer gases. And it's this really unique union of masculine and feminine. You know, the outer gases, the oxygen, the atmospheric gases, they have a more positive charge. And then the negative charge is coming up within the water. And right where the spring emerges, there's this incredible phenomenon that happens. It's like this water multiplication effect. It's sort of the way that your body actually creates metabolic waters inside of your cells through the merging of hydrogen and ozone. And so the, the earth actually has this water generation effect here. I mean, hydrogen itself in Latin literally means hydro, water, and gen, creating. And so when you give hydrogen the right environment, it can actually generate water in a way that you'll never hear a hydrologist talk about this. It's not exactly mainstream water science, what we're talking about here. They'll say that the amount of water that's on the planet now is the same that's always been here. It's the same that will always be there, except for some comets hitting the earth that bring water with them. But I think it's really important that we all recognize this because we are in a severe water drought and it's going to take everyone respecting and stewarding the magic of life generation that happens at springs in order to reverse this, or that's one of the things that it's going to take for sure. Now, of course, there's, they're so purely filtered it, with perhaps the exception of seepage springs, for example, they're really shallow springs or, you know, springs that are, again, in the middle of a, a cow field or in the middle of a, a city, you want to get those tested. Or if you know that your aquifer is affected by fracking, you can go to fracktracker.org to find out if your aquifer might be affected by that. Also, if you know if there's a big bottling plant, water bottling facility in your area that might be affecting your watershed, you want to check into that. But for the most part, you know, I know people who have been harvesting spring water for decades. I've been doing it for over a decade now, and, and I've never had any adverse reactions. So you can take your water to get it tested at the same place that you would take well water to get it tested. And you can go to findaspring.com to find your nearest spring. So findaspring.com. I just want to like... <laughs> Pound that into everyone's brains. I found there's a very obvious one just a couple miles from where I live that everyone goes to. And, you know, there's infrastructure set up around it with pipes and like a, a covering for when it's raining. It's really nice. Mm -hmm. But I found other ones in my area that I didn't know about. And one in my hometown of South Lake Tahoe that I didn't know about. So that's a really great resource that's, um, you know, it's just it's people who are adding to it all the time. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's user supported. So if any of the listeners know of a spring that's not already on there, please feel free to add it. And, I'm, you know, people are often just shocked by how prevalent they are. Mm-hmm. They, they really are everywhere. I mean, I was living in New York and there's a spring on Staten mm-hmm. Island. <laughs> They're all around. Wow. Yeah. And there's like a comment section. So for the one that's near us, that's very popular, there were just tons of comments, including one from a woman who had gotten it tested and had posted the results. And we've always wondered, you know, and then like, there they were. So what an amazing community resource. Mm -hmm. So is, is spring water then like your number one recommendation for getting structured water into our bodies? It is. It's my number one recommendation for sure. Well, that and to eat your water, because anytime you eat fruits and vegetables, they automatically contain structured water. That's it's bio water. So it's going to absorb into your body more easily. If you have an option between drinking a bottle of regular bulk water or eating an apple, you're going to get far more hydrated from the apple. You know, the bulk water is just going to go straight through you. So the easiest way for most people is actually fruits and vegetables. Wow. But then when it comes to actual drinking water, definitely spring water would be my first recommendation. Mm -hmm. Let's just touch really briefly on eight glasses of water a day and this idea of irrigation versus hydration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So irrigation is the process of drinking water. And then hydration is how much your body can actually absorb and the way that water goes to work throughout the body and is able to sort of do all of its magic. (laughs) I mean, every single function that the body performs, everything from folding proteins to the thoughts that you're having right now, they all require water to function. Um, And so a lot of people are really great at irrigating. They drink a lot of water, but if A, if the water that they drink isn't very high quality, it could actually be literally dehydrating them. So a lot of people who drink reverse osmosis or distilled water, for example, those are not only bulk and unstructured, but they're also what hydrologists call an aggressive solvent. So they've been basically robbed of everything. They've had all of the minerals sucked out of them. And so they're hungry. They want to fill themselves up, right? The the water wants to fill itself up. So when you drink that water, it can actually leach minerals from inside of you, which is dehydrating over time. Even the World Health Organization warns against drinking reverse osmosis and distilled water in the long term, warning over things like diuresis and heart disease and, and stuff like that. So irrigation is important, but hydration is something that we that we want to focus on more so also just by not just drinking higher quality water and eating water dense food, but really optimizing our bodies to be able to absorb whatever water we drink. So, you know, when you're born, you're around 90% water by volume. But by the time you're an elder, you're around only maybe 50% water. And this isn't necessarily because people are drinking less. It's just that their bodies lose the ability to absorb and retain it. So the clearest measure of your true biological age is your intracellular hydration or how much water is inside your cells. As, as we were saying with Dr. Zach Bush, you know, he's done a lot of work around the phase angle, which is a great way to get your, your level of hydration measured because that osmotic flow of water in and out of the cell is really mediated by the amount of uh, electrical charge is present at the cell membrane. So there are a lot of different ways. There are a lot of different ways to optimize your body for hydration, but maybe one of the most important ways is to bump up your phase angle. Um, and you can do this really just by supporting your cell membranes more so. And how do you do that? Uh, So you want to get lots of really good high quality fats in your diet, lots of omega sixes or no, I'm sorry, omega threes and nines, omega sixes. We've got plenty of in our diets these days. There's also a supplement called NT factor that sort of rebuilds your, your cell membranes. You can take a supplement called horsetail that has lots of organified silica and in general, making sure that you're avoiding EMFs. This is really, really important. So your body actually cannot absorb hydration when it's in the presence of strong man-made electromagnetic fields. So you have all of these, uh, what's called the gap junctions in your body that are basically these 
under a microscope, they sort of look like these long fiber optic cables that channel electrical energy from without ex exiting into the extracellular matrix, you know, from one cell cytoplasm to the next. And so a really hydrated, healthy body sort of has this electrical circuitry that channels an enormous amount of charge. Like one epithelial cell, for example, can carry a charge of over 10,000 volts. That's just, that's, that's the amount of electricity in a lightning bolt in a cell membrane that's only microns thick. I mean, this is absolutely down to the quantum level. It defies physics. Again, it's one of these ways that water makes life possible by channeling so much energy for us. And so when you're in the presence of, of really strong EMFs, these gap junctions can begin to resonate at a different frequency than they were intended to. And they are intended to resonate at very specific frequencies so that you can absorb and utilize all of this water. So definitely getting high quality EMF protectors, even Faraday cages, potentially protecting yourself from 5G. Never use your cell phone right up to your, right up to your head. Always use the speaker feature. And... I think this is something that's just increasingly important for us to educate ourselves on, because even if you are drinking the highest quality spring water and you vortex it and you mineralize it and you bless it and all of these different factors of bringing water back into its natural state, it's not going to make a whole lot of difference if you're drinking it next to a Wi-Fi router. Mm hmm. We, I didn't talk about this in episode 71 with Carly, but that's how she came into water science was she was so sick from EMF radiation and it was her like path back to healing from that that got her into water. So, okay, you, meant, you mentioned um, vortexing water. Let's talk about that. Why would someone want to do that? I mean, we've already talked a little bit about that. And I mean, I just love that something as simple as like a really cheap latte frother can do this for someone. Mm -hmm. Let's make this really simple for people who want to structure their water at home. Maybe they don't have access to spring water yet, or maybe like me, you know, it, we have to go about every week. So on day seven, my water has been sitting there still for seven days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are a few things that break apart the structure of water. And one is stagnation. Another is heat, for example, or exposure to these EMFs will break apart the structure of water. But if you do need to keep your water still for a little while while you store it, then there are a lot of factors that can affect the structure. So for example, if you keep it cool, if you keep it dark, that's gonna help it to hold its structure for a little longer. If you keep it in glass rather than plastic, if you keep it in, in dark glass or a really amazing kind of glass like Myron glass or Flaska glass can help it keep its structure. But I think probably the most effective way to structure your water, and this is true even, I mean, there are times, you know, I'm a, I'm a traveler and sometimes you just have to drink what you have on hand, um, especially if you're in the airport or somewhere. And I know some people might not be as close to a spring as they would like to be. So if you have to drink distilled or reverse osmosis water, then you definitely want to bring some structure to it. And I think the simplest way is to vortex it. So what that means is you're basically just creating a cyclone in the water. When water spirals together, then the molecules bond together. And you see this again, everywhere in nature, you know, in a cyclone in water down a, a, a drain in sap, going through a tree. It doesn't just flow through the tree. It spirals through the tree in your body. We talked about the blood in your veins earlier. Also your cerebral spinal fluid vortexes. In fact, in German, the word for spinal column is spiral column. The word for vertebrae is vortices. Even your urine comes out in a spiral from your urethra. So nature is always spiraling liquids in these really interesting ways. And so when you mimic that, when you bring this cyclone motion into the water, then it creates a, a crystalline formation in the molecules. And again, like we talked about earlier with Schwenk, this is the ideal time to pattern the water with your prayers or with sound frequency or whatever it is. So there are lots of kind of fancy vortex machines out there that you can get. And they're really wonderful because they can keep your water in more of a constant vortex and sort of this constant flow. I have a friend who even designed 
one of his own. If you go to my Instagram and it's somewhere on my story highlights, I mean, he made this incredible water dispenser that constantly vortexes the water from parts that were about $50 at the hardware store. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of ways that you can sort of DIY this. I have a friend who vortexes big five gallon carboys all at once because he goes, you know, on these spring water missions and he wants to vortex a lot at once. And you can just get these really big couplers and then build kind of a cage for the two bottles out of dowel rods basically in that case or even just the two bottles of water you can get a coupler uh, I have links for that I have a whole resource guide actually pdf resource guide where people can find vortexing couplers and vortexing bottles and like you said latte frothers and all of these different tools to help you do this but it's pretty simple if you're working with two bottles you would just have one bottle that's full and one bottle that's empty and you add this coupler really really great if that coupler has magnets in it because magnetized water is profoundly magical and then you get the water flowing typically you want to go counterclockwise you, on the northern hemisphere you want to go counterclockwise you can go clockwise too but it that's mostly for dispelling information at least according to mj pangman's research clockwise will dispel information before it attracts structure versus going counterclockwise will just immediately start attracting structure my favorite travel tool, like you mentioned, a latte frother generates a good solid cyclone in there, or there's also these little protein blender bottles where they're, they're made, yeah, for just blending your protein powder into water, but they make a really nice cyclone. And there's one that actually even has a little, I have a link to it, um, in the guide, it has a little compartment where people are supposed to store their protein powder, but it's perfect for storing crystals in. <laughs> and then the little magnetic base at, or the little uh, vortexing base at the bottom actually has a magnet in there as well. I'm not sure if it's a North or South Pole magnet. Um, and the manufacturer hasn't been able to get back to me on that because it's just part of the design so that the magnet clips in and it's easy to wash. But it also, Mm. Little do they know that they're sitting on a gold mine of water structuring here. Mm, wow. W which guide are you talking about that has these resources? And I know it's very much in the online course, so many resources and links to all sorts of water structuring things. Yeah. So just last month, actually, I released a 50 page resource guide. It's now included in the course. So if anyone gets the course or if you took the course before I made it, I can just send it to you. Or it's also available by donation on my site. If you just want to get the guide and you don't want to get the course, it's like a $1 to $10 donation or donate whatever you want and you can get that download. Okay, great. I get this is like such a bigger conversation that we have time to talk about right now. And there are other things people can do like adding minerals, electrolytes, doing near mm -hmm. infrared light. There's just, there's so much more than we have time for, but it's all in the course. So beautifully done. There's so many ways to structure water. And every single one of those ways is just a matter of turning towards nature and looking and seeing, okay, what does nature do? How does nature create vibrant, vital living water? Well, it's going to be full of electrolytes so that it can have, you know, a high electrical conductivity and it's going to be magnetized by the paramagnetic rocks that are down in the in the aquifers and there are ways that we can mimic nature and in, in all of these ways that are actually just a lot of fun to work with they again they create this communion this relationship between you and what will be your blood mm -hmm. so i think creating some ceremony and some reciprocal communion in, in the process of structuring your water is one of the most profound aspects to all of it, even beyond the health benefits that you get from drinking this kind of water. Mm, absolutely. And it's so profound how you speak about removing this intermediary of your local municipal government and the water system or these massive water bottling companies that are creating so much waste and so much harm to ecosystems. Thank you for framing it that way. That was really helpful for me. And I just love this idea of stepping more into relationship with wild water and then playing with structuring it, with these various means, especially my own consciousness, thoughts, and emotions. I would love to briefly touch on fascia. I, I remember I was getting body work done, myofascial release work like 20 years ago or something. And this woman, yeah, I was in my early 20s. I'm 39 now explaining to me what fascia was and my mind was just so blown. And ever since then, I've loved learning about fascia and 
loved seeing it was like two or three years ago when it kind of exploded into like you know the public consciousness in a new way and then learning recently how fascia is just what you you in your webinar say that it's an intelligent matrix of 75% water and 25% protein that conducts electrical signals at the speed of sound, which is 700 miles per hour, far faster than nerve signals. And this is due to structured water's properties of quantum coherence that we talked about earlier. And fascia, for anyone who doesn't know, it, it covers our entire body. If, if everything but our fascia was taken away, you you would still recognize yourself as yourself or your friend as their friend because it's right underneath the skin and it's it's in the shape of us and it's such an important part of our bodies so i i would just love for you to tell us any any thoughts you have about fascia and true hydration yeah i'm so glad you mentioned this because fascia is it's so fascinating it's fascinating <laughs> so <laughs> Really, when it comes to irrigation, like we were talking about earlier, the best way to prime your body to be able to absorb more water is movement. And that's because one of the most important aspects of hydration is your fascia. Your fascia acts as a hydraulic system. Hydraulic means movement by water. So it's one of your body's main modes of hydration and irrigation. It sends water wherever it's needed most. And like you said, if you were to remove everything else, you would it would still look like you because it connects every single cell. It's fascia connects every single cell. And when you look at it, a few years ago, they released a video. I think you can find it. It's called Walking Under the Skin or Strolling Under the Skin or something like that where this fiber optic camera exposed this exquisite mesh of water droplets. It's literally a web and it's always pulsing and moving almost like it's breathing. It's this clear gel-like netting that transports the water as it expands and as it contracts, it passes the water along its tubing, like just like irrigating a garden, right? And so if you are drinking lots of water, even if it's really high quality water, but you're not moving, you're not stretching, you're not moving your fascia, then that water isn't able to get where into the cells where it needs to go. And then also the lymph as well is a really, really important factor in this because you actually have three times more lymph than blood. You might have five liters of blood and 15 liters of lymphatic fluid inside you at any moment. And of course the lymphatic fluid is vastly water. I forget the, the exact numbers, but I think it's something like 90% water. And it also does not have a pump other than your own movement. So for your water, to, for your body to get the water into the cells, you need to be moving your fascia. And for the water to detoxify your cells, you need to be moving your lymph. So irrigation is largely, largely through movement. But what I find most interesting about fascia is not even like the, the anatomical, biological side of things like that, but it's sort of the implications of, you know, they've done studies showing what happens first, the thought or the body's reaction. When something, when anything external arises in your environment, they, as the researchers assumed that you would think a thought and then almost immediately, but definitely afterwards, your body would react to that thought. And what they found was sort of exactly the opposite. Your body has a reaction first. And it's thought to be because of the proprioceptive awareness of your fascia. So this fascia actually is very, very conscious of its environment. If you trip and fall, your, your fascia knows to balance you even long before your conscious mind does. It all happens in a split second, of course, but, but your fascia is very, very sensitive and very aware. And they've also done studies, um, and I forget the exact method of the study. I think this was in, in Carly's book, actually, where they took a brain dead person. I'm forgetting. I'll have to revisit this. But anyway, basically, they showed that the body itself stores memory. And, and those of us who practice yoga, or we've studied like somatic awareness, we know that, that our body keeps a record of pretty much everything. And it does that through this watery matrix that stores energy and information and vibration, this matrix of the fascia. Now, your fascia actually grows into muscles, grows into ligaments, grows into bones. All of your muscles, ligaments, and bones were once fascia. 
were once this 80% water. And so when we work with our fascia very conscientiously and intentionally, not only can we release a lot of emotional toxic stored memories or traumas that might be stored in that watery memory of the body, but we can also have a huge influence on the way that our body develops over time. Mm. Yeah, I'm currently going through the structural integration series. There's it's 12 body work sessions, about two hours each. And I've done three of them so far. It grew out of Ida Rolf's work with what people call Rolfie now. And it's been so profound. It's mind blowing. And I've gotten body work for over 20 years in my life, but this has been totally next level. And it's really interesting for me now to be thinking of it in terms of fascia and hydration, because I, I am having memories surface. I'm having just completely fascinating things arise as a result of this body work mm, it sounds really profound and it just reminds me when you say that even the word memory itself comes from I think it's the Greek word mem which means water I mean water is basically synonymous with memory so our body water stores so much for us not just from this lifetime but perhaps even previous that sounds like really really profound body work wow yeah yeah, it absolutely has been. So thank you for this briefly touching on other lifestyle factors that affect dehydration, such as electromagnetic frequencies and movement. So simple, it's so profound. And before we close, I mean, this is, this is a huge topic and we can do a whole nother conversation just on this, but I really appreciate you speaking about the politics behind mm. water and water wars and what is happening with the desertification of many parts of the planet. And I've heard you say that by 2050, one in two people will not have access to safe drinking water. What is going on and what can we do? Mm. Yeah, this is, as you said, this is a whole rabbit hole and it's it's one of the most important topics. So just to sort of touch on it briefly, like you said, by the year 2050, 50% of humanity won't have access to clean water. Even currently, right now, as things stand, one in three people have no access to clean water. And those of us who live in water-rich areas or we live in the global north, you know, we're fortunate enough to have the privilege to be able to ignore this or just not be exposed to it. But the fact is that there is a very clear water apartheid in the world right now. And since the privatization of water, we're in an era where those who can afford water have the right to live and those who cannot have the right to suffer and die of, of waterborne illness. According to the World Health Organization, over 80% of disease worldwide is caused by drinking dirty water over 80% of worldwide diseases. And every single eight seconds, a child dies from drinking dirty water. So right now, water is actually being used as a weapon of war, a weapon of war against the global South and developing nations, and very vehemently as a weapon of war in places like Palestine, which is the most water-starved uh, territory on the planet. And it's really crucial that we look at this because we can trace the drought, the global drought and desertification immediately back to water privatization. When we treat water as an inanimate object, as a good for sale rather than a, a commons of all, then it begins to disappear really quickly um, just due to rerouting and greedy forces in the world. What's interesting about this is if you look back throughout human history, there have been so many civilizations that have self-destructed because of their water practices, mm -hmm. like the old kingdom empire of Egypt, the Mayan civilization, the Ming dynasty, so many more, they all collapsed because they mismanaged their water supplies and they caused drought. And we're really poised at the same fate right now because Water is the primary vehicle that distributes the sun's energy around the planet, right? We have to start taking water more seriously because if we solve the hydrological crisis, we will solve the climate crisis, period. Water can reverse climate change. In fact, it may be the only thing that can. Mm -hmm. Carbon, CO2, mediates less than 5% of the total energy in the atmosphere. 95% of the energy in the atmosphere is governed by the Earth's hydrology. 
And nothing can affect the world's climate faster than the H2O molecule. It's literally the intermediary between the sun and the planet's ecology from global scale phase changes to fluctuating sea surface temperatures to cloud microphysics to atmospheric re regulation. Water is, is, again, it's the mediator of, of solar energy on Earth. And so the depletion of the hydrological cycle is just as great a cause of climate change as greenhouse gas emissions. It's just as great a cause as greenhouse gas emissions and restoring the hydrological cycle will remediate greenhouse gas emissions faster than any other solution currently being proposed. And we can trace all of this back to the privatization of water. And to it, and, and you know, the, it, it's multifaceted. You know, I'm obviously simplifying it here for the sake of time. Um, you know, there was the whole green revolution that happened in the 50s that really shifted our agricultural practices, and 75% of water worldwide is used for agriculture. So that shifted the use of water considerably. And, and so it's just been ramifications of, of different water dis, water based decisions that we've made that have led to the, the climate crisis and we really have to start taking water more seriously not only for the climate but for world peace in general because a lot of the wars that are happening on this planet right now they're painted in the media to be religious conflicts or ethnic conflicts but you can trace so many of them directly back to drought and the resource scarcity that happens as a result of that. So this is, yeah, it's a really deep rabbit hole, but I really encourage people to get involved with water guardianship and water activism on some level, because, you know, we are, we are not protecting water, we are water protecting herself. And it really takes all of us standing for the primacy of water as the facilitator of life and the facilitator of peace if we want a future that is not full of death and full of war it comes back to the source of life itself i have a i have a child's question here like who who is privatizing water who <laughs> who is giving themselves this godlike power to say i now control this water when it has belonged to the people and especially the indigenous people of the area forever yeah so i mean this is the new colonialism right <laughs> it doesn't come on ships it is economic wars it's resource privatization it's trade agreements Basically, there is this global water cartel, and they are more dangerous than any drug cartel ever, but no one has heard of them. It's these companies like Suez and Veolia and Bechtel and RWE Thames. Um, and it sort of started back in like the 70s, 80s, actually. It was the first time that the UN ever referred to water as a commodity. And once they started commodifying it, um, you know, back then, no one could have possibly imagined water being traded like a stock on the stock exchange. Back then, no one could have imagined paying more for a gallon of water than you would pay for gasoline. Nowadays, we take those things for granted. And yet, when they started selling off these water rights, it was basically they, they had to do so in poor and developing nations because of these economic hitmen that would go in and they would say, you know, we'll help develop your country, but then you owe us, or we'll protect you from this, these guerrilla thugs. A lot of times the quote unquote guerrillas were actually seeded by the CIA. Um, and then they would go in and say, oh, we'll, we'll protect you from impending civil war, but then you owe us, or we'll give you these huge loans, but then you owe us, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's actually a really great book called I think it's called Economic Hitmen by one of the men who was employed by the CIA, who you know had a front row seat to all of this happening. And it still continues happening today. And so they, they had to sell off their resources to these different companies. And in pretty much every single case, the water would be shut off or it would be delivered completely not potable, or they would it would, they would just charge so much for it that a family might be paying a full third or full half of their entire monthly salary just to afford water. And it, it's so common. It's so common. It's even happened in the United States. You know, a lot of the water is not municipal 
it's, it's been privatized. It's been sold off to these companies. Um, and they nowadays, because they've gotten such a bad reputation, they actually operate under names of sub companies. So it might not be called Suez, but it might be a subsidiary of Suez, for example. If you can always follow the money trail back to these main companies. And the scariest part is that the World Trade Organization and the World Bank take their orders directly from these companies when they're writing economic policy about water. They basically just turn to this water cartel and say, hey, you know, write this policy for us. Or what do you think we should do? Or the water cartel lobbies so hard in the World Trade Organization and the UN that they just get whatever they want passed. And obviously they're not going to want to send clean water or enable clean water in places where people are too poor to pay for it. And they're too poor to pay for it because of the economic blackmail that has happened, allowing them to privatize water in the first place. It's really insidious. It's dark, but it's so important because this question of privatizing water will determine for the rest of human history from now all the way forward for all of the future generations to come, whether or not human beings have the right to live because you might not be able to control life itself, but if you control water, then you control the lives of everyone who needs access to it in order to live. In fact, in Chinese, the word for control is the same as the word for water, or the symbol for control is the same as the symbol for water. So it's up to each one of us to get very, very involved politically in this process. Wow, yeah, I mean, it like truly, you know, whatever cause you're championing in your life, like, is it more important than this one? I, I have a hard time believing that anything is more important than the future of of water as a human right for everyone. Well, it's interesting because all causes kind of tie into this cause in some way. Because as Victor Schauberger said, water is the capital of capital itself. There is no capitalism without exploiting water. Because if you want to grow something, if you want to sell something, you're going to have to exploit water as an object Mm -hmm. in order to do that. And so if we really get down to freeing water then that undermines all of capitalism itself. And if you undermine capitalism right then and there, you've undermined the patriarchy, you've undermined racism, you've undermined sexism, homophobia, all of these things that tie into capitalism in so many insidious ways. And and it really takes this massive decolonization. It really takes first decolonizing our minds and then decolonizing every aspect of our interaction with the world at large. And, And nothing less than that will free water. I'm aware of Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s organization, Water Keepers. Is is that a good one to be supporting or do you have other organizations or folks that we can be supporting in this or any other action items? Yeah, I love, I love Water Keepers Alliance. There's also the Blue Planet Project that is really good. Um, That one is headed by Maude Barlow. And if you're really interested in the geopolitics of water, all of her books are amazing, but especially Blue Future, that's the most recent one, or even Blue Gold. They made a documentary called called Blue Gold or Tapped or Last Call at the Oasis. So that doesn't exactly answer your question. That's to learn more. (laughs) But then if you want to actually uh, support Yeah, the Blue Planet Project is great. Waterislifemovement.com has a list of different indigenous communities who are fighting projects, just like the Dakota Access Pipeline. I mean, you know, that one got a lot of press because it was politically convenient to have a distraction at the time. But there are currently over 90 other pipeline projects in the United States, just like Dakota Access, and they all need your help and your love and your support. Just find one that's closest to you and and pour yourself into into protecting those waters. So waterislifemovement.com for that. You can also go to commoncause.org to find out exactly who your representatives are, and then speak with them directly about what your district is doing with water privatization and protecting the watersheds there. Mm-hmm. Or you could just go directly. There's a, a program called caringforyourwatersheds.com that 
focuses more so on engaging students with local watershed activism, but I really love that because it's important to, to really get to children young. And then the last one I would recommend, I mean, there are so many, but another really good one is internationalrivers.org. So they are a group of lawyers that is actually lobbying to give rivers the same rights as human beings. And it's working really well, actually. I, oh, no, I'm sorry. I got that URL wrong. Um, that's a good one, too. But I think it's earthlawcenter.org and the rightsofnature.org are giving rivers legal rights. Okay. Oh, and then, no, 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 I'm sorry. The last one is really important. So we're actually in the process of working towards an international water law. And you can support this at codes.earth slash water law and really get involved there because it's a it's a beautiful project with a lot of really wide sweeping potential. Was that codes.earth? Mm-hmm. Codes.earth slash water law. Okay. I will have all of these links in the show notes. I'm right in this moment I'm just feeling like fuck this. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I feel you 100%. I mean, you know, that's just the way all of us are feeling all the time lately. But really, like, what the fuck? Messing with water and, like, human access to clean I just thank you so much for educating me on this. I think, like, so many people, I've had, like, a vague idea and I've heard the phrase water wars and I know about the fracking and, you know, but it, it feels overwhelming and it feels, like, hard to find information really. So thank you so much for educating me on that, on structured water on how to hydrate my body and not just irrigate it and just everything else. And I want to just again, say that you are a central hub for information on all of this and more. Your website is waterislife.love. I'm also a dot love website. <laughs> I love people who do that. You know, actually, let's let's close this out with water and love. You talk about this in your webinar, a living liquid crystal. And I was so appreciative. You know, I just I love when people aren't afraid to talk about love. So <laughs> What is the song between water and love? Mm, Well, hydrogen is negatively charged. So it's a more feminine atom. Oxygen is positively charged. So it's a more masculine atom. And it's through this polarity, through this magnetism. It's only because they love each other so much because they really desire to be together. It's just through their constant lovemaking that all of life is possible. Okay. Thank you so much, Isabel. So grateful for your eloquence and your passion and your skill at conveying this information. And I'm just very honored to have spoken with you today and to be a bridge between your knowledge and wisdom and whoever's ears these words fall upon. Mm, thank you. Thank you so much, Amber. I really appreciate the the invitation and the opportunity to just chat with you and connect with you. And yeah, I look forward to getting to know you a bit better. I, I've looked through um, some of your episodes and, and uh, listened to sort of skimmed through a few of them. And I was like, oh my God, I want to listen. This is my new favorite podcast. I want to listen to all of them. So I'm excited to dive in more and thank you for your work and for all that you're bringing to your community. It's definitely an enlightening force of of positive change in the world. I have so much respect for what you do. Thank you. It's all done with love. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Thank you for taking these medicine stories in. I hope they inspire you to keep walking the mythic path of your own unfolding self. I love sharing information and will always put any relevant links in the show notes. You can find past episodes, my blog, and our handmade herbal medicines at mythicmedicine.love. We've got reishi, lion's mane, elderberry, mugwort, yarrow, redwood, body oils, an amazing sleep medicine, heart medicine, 
earth essences so much more, more than I can list there mythicmedicine.love. While you're there, check out my quiz, which healing herb is your spirit medicine? It's fun and lighthearted, but the results are really in-depth and designed to bring you into closer alignment with both the medicine that you're in need of and the medicine that you already carry and can bring to others. If you love the show, please consider supporting it at patreon.com slash medicine stories. It is so worth your while. There are dozens and dozens of killer rewards there, and I've been told by many folks that it's the best Patreon out there. We've got ebooks, downloadable PDFs, bonus interviews, guided meditations, giveaways, resource guides, links to online learning and behind the scenes stuff, and just so much more. The best of it is available at the $2 a month level. Thank you. And please subscribe on whichever app you use. Just click that little subscribe button and review on iTunes. It's so helpful. And if you do that, you just may be featured in a listener spotlight in the future. The music that opens the show is by Marie Sue. That's M-A-R-I-E-E-S-I-O-U-X from her beautiful song, Wild Eyes. Thank you, Marie. And thanks to you all. I look forward to 